Thank you to today's sponsor, BetterHelp. I know firsthand how crucial it can be to talk to somebody when stressors and negativity set in. And BetterHelp makes it extremely simple to connect remotely to licensed therapists that can help. More on that at the end of the video. Unfavorable wind, a parting gift from last night's storm, stalls the American expedition for the day. Now Meriwether Lewis and William Clark detect a Frenchman coming down the river, carrying pelts and news from the great Osage people. They learn the Osage received a letter on behalf of the American government, informing them that the French have sold this territory, and that their land and a vast stretch of the continent belong now to the United States of America. The Osage did not believe it and burned the letter. A century of trading furs and captives to French and other European traders has furnished the Osage with many metal goods, horses, and guns. This commerce, along with colonial invasion, has destabilized the region, setting in motion a terrifying arms race that inflames old enmities between indigenous nations. Osage country is nevertheless vast and vigorously defended. Along the western fringe, the feared Comanche have laid waste to Osage villages. In the black of night around a Comanche settlement, an Osage party comes to steal horses. They rustle hundreds and the party leader enters a lodge, strikes a Comanche warrior with his tomahawk, and makes his name known. I am Black Dog. The hulking Black Dog, standing six foot six, is one of many chiefs among the numerous bands of the Osage a people whose power is not lost on the American government. While Lewis and Clark continue west, a delegation of Osage leaders is beckoned to Washington, D.C. President Thomas Jefferson requests that they keep peace and foster trade with the United States. He later writes to the Secretary of the Navy, The truth is, the Osage are the great nation south of the Missouri, as the Sioux are great north of that river. With these two powerful nations, we must stand well, because in their quarter, we are miserably weak. The Osage, for their part, are acutely familiar with foreign powers. Early contacts with the French yielded goods, ties to Jesuit missionaries, and even intermarriage. An Osage chief joined a delegation that went to France and met King Louis XV. And when Spanish authorities claimed Louisiana, their attempts at breaking the power of the Osage failed. The Osage have always adapted. Their traditions tell how they migrated to the region in the preceding centuries, part of a people that later became the Osage and other surrounding nations. In earlier times, they called themselves Neokonska, the children of the middle waters, for their old stories profess a sacred connection to the water. And the Osage settle at the confluence of large rivers in villages comprising longhouse-style lodgings. At sunrise, they pray for harmony and peace to Wakanta, the great cosmic life force. Osage women busy themselves planting and gathering corn, beans, and squash, among other things, while men hunt what they can. Men and women alike present themselves elaborately in jewelry, body paints, and tattoos. So extensive is their domain that for months in the summer and fall, the Osage migrate to the plains for the great bison hunt then move again, swaddling into smaller lodgings when the frost of winter approaches. Black Dog has overseen the construction of a great trail to facilitate both these migrations and raids on enemies. The Osage have resolved not to make war on the United States, but threats to their land are mounting. Euro-American settlers and displaced indigenous groups have begun hunting in and around Osage territory. The tall and redoubtable Osage warriors take from, beat, and in dire times kill intruders. In 1808, Meriwether Lewis, now governor of Louisiana, resolves to subdue the Osage. He blocks their vital trade networks and impels local indigenous groups to attack them. William Clark then pushes several Osage chiefs to sign a treaty ceding the eastern half of their domain, 50 million acres, to the United States. Several signers believe they merely agreed to share this as hunting territory. Moreover, the Osage traditionally make decisions by consensus, such that no handful of leaders can speak for all Osage. The U.S. government nevertheless claims the land, and eager to remove indigenous peoples in the east, 
permits a large number of Cherokee to settle on it. An Osage chief called Claremore later explains that the ensuing bloodshed is not born of hatred, but desperation. When we want meat for our women and children and clothing, our dependence is in the woods. If we do not get it there, we must go hungry and naked. When the president gave the Cherokees land we had sold him, he certainly did not give to the Cherokee all the beaver, bear, buffalo, and deer on our lands. When the Cherokees hunt in our land, we will always have trouble, and our young men will kill them. That raiding and warfare between indigenous groups have been stoked in part by the U.S. government does not, in any measure, diminish their intensity. In 1817, when Chief Claremore and his band go to hunt on the plains, they leave only young children, women, and elderly in the village. The attack comes like a sudden storm. Hundreds of Cherokee and their allies, including some Americans, thunder in, killing dozens of people and capturing many more. They take what they can carry, and then burn the village. The attackers then advance toward Black Dog's nearby village. The chief earlier constructed a concealed cave for such times. There his band hides in safety while their homes are pillaged. No longer can the Osage muster the strength to stem the tide of displaced native groups and settlers, who bring epidemics and deplete animal populations. Osage chiefs cede the majority of their domain in exchange for government payments which often take the form of substandard trade goods. And thus they find themselves on a narrow strip of their former domain, deprived of sovereignty by the very nation on which they had refused to make war. In 1833, when some Osage learn that the Kiowa may have hunted in their territory, a war party rides out in black paint, the sign that no quarter will be given. The Osage fall upon a camp of old men, women, and children. They take two children as prisoners, and the rest are killed, their heads placed in brass pots for their kin to find. The Kiowa calendar solemnly records this as the summer they cut off their heads. Vengeance from the Kiowa and their Comanche allies is sure to follow, but soon the U.S. government makes an expedition and brokers peace between the groups. The Americans seek to stabilize the region to more easily remove native peoples to the east, clearing the land for slave-harvested cotton production. The long forced journeys to so-called Indian territory decimate native populations. American soldiers drive over 15,000 Cherokee from their homes in 1838 and force them on a 5,000 mile march over the winter months. Over a quarter of them die. Meanwhile, Osage who have refused to relocate to their reservation are beaten and removed. The wartime actions of individual bands of Osage warriors have been used by American observers to deem forfeit the rights and traditions of all Osage, to cast a people on the edge as warlike and debased. On the contrary, a Jesuit who lived among them remarks, There are few nations in this region as affable and as affectionate as the Osages. Indeed, it may be said that it is natural to them to wish to live in perfect friendship with all whom they know. Another echoed this. Strangers are always pleased with the hospitality of these people. They will divide the last meal and never suffer one to go hungry from their village or remain there in want if they have to give. Black Dog dies in the mid-19th century. When the Civil War ruptures the nation, the Osage endeavor to remain neutral. But seeking allies, the slaveholding confederacy courts the Osage by promising increased sovereignty and payment. Some Osage join them, but most remain loyal to the Union. When Confederate agents pass through their land and kill an Osage, the Osage respond with the standard treatment for intruders. They kill the Confederates and cut off their heads. In the gray aftermath of the war, little changes. Black Dog's son of the same name still witnesses American settlers move on to Osage land, which induces the U.S. government not to enforce the boundaries, but to acquire more land. Indigenous nations that once sprawled over the continent are bound to bordering reservations on stark streaks of earth in the middle of the country. The Osage sell their land and purchase as their reservation a different section of their old domain. The land beyond looks different, sounds different. The wine of metal hammers and black vapor, the houses farmers and their little children. 
Decades before, an Osage chief had told an American, I see and admire your way of living, your good warm houses, your cows, oxen, workhorses, wagons, and a thousand machines. But everything about you is in chains, and you are slaves yourselves. Talk to my sons, perhaps they may be persuaded to adopt your fashions. But for myself, I was born free, was raised free, and wished to die free. Now in the spring, on the old Osage river bottoms, the crops sprout for nobody. And in the summer, the plains sit still. The bison are a memory, nearly extinct. The U.S. government passes legislation forcing reservation land to be allotted to individual members and selling what remains to American settlers. The Osage are exempt, having previously negotiated to hold their land in common. Partly through the Council of Black Dog II, the Osage retain mineral rights to their reservation even as the surface land is divided. So when oil men scouring the country take an interest in the black sludge under the Osage reservation, they pay the Osage millions of dollars in lease rights and royalties. In two decades, Osage oil produces more wealth than every American gold rush combined. This newfound prosperity attracts crooked and murderous outsiders who attempt to rob the Osage of their oil rights. And after it all, the path before the Osage runs through courtrooms and federal departments. It concerns the pages of treaties and petitions for rights and allowances. So continues the long stand for survival and preservation of the people called the Osage. Stress, anxiety, and negative thoughts tend to be a part of life, but when they're becoming too much, I've found that talking to a therapist can be a game changer. That's why I'm excited to talk to you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online platform whose mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible. You sign up for BetterHelp, answer some questions about you, your needs and goals, and you're matched with a professional licensed therapist. In as little as a few days, you can connect with them via video chat, phone call, or even chat if you prefer. I've put a link at the top of the description. It's betterhelp.com slash historydose. Clicking that link helps support the channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can talk to a therapist and see if it helps. Of course, you don't click with every person that you talk to, therapists included, so BetterHelp allows you to switch to another licensed therapist at no additional cost. Talking to somebody has helped me clarify and improve certain thought patterns, so I can say that if you're struggling, consider online therapy. Just click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash historydose. 